Hello, and welcome to the Tech Dirt Podcast. I'm Mike Masnick. One of the key themes that we've discussed for years over at Tech Dirt involves new business models for areas that used to rely almost exclusively on copyright, with music being a key one. There are many reasons for this, with one of them being that music was really the first industry to go through a full-scale disruption thanks to the internet. And I always believed that it was kind of a leading indicator for nearly every other industry and how they would eventually be disrupted. We're seeing it already in movies, software, and in newspapers, and we're seeing the very beginnings of it in places like transportation, communications, and manufacturing, as well as some other areas. And it won't be too long before we see it in finance, healthcare, energy, and many other industries as well. As such, I was hopeful, perhaps naively so, that if we really studied the music industry and thought long and hard about business model opportunities that embraced, rather than feared the disruption, we might not only learn how to help the music industry thrive throughout all of this, but also learn some important lessons that could be used by other industries as well. And hopefully, this could be done without trying to destroy the internet or other sorts of reactionary responses to innovation. Of course, many of these early fights over the music industry business models are over. The whole idea of not releasing music in some sort of digital format is seen as ridiculous for the most part these days. But there are still many new fights. Some argue that streaming services like Spotify and Pandora are saviors for the industry, while others rightly recognize that, at best, services like these are just a tiny piece of the overall market. For years, my own focus has been on trying to get content creators of all kinds to look to build up true connections with fans and then focus on the unique scarcities that those content creators can offer to fans that no one else can copy. I still think that this is a good idea, though one of the many problems with it is that it's not necessarily a clear path for content creators. Coming up with something unique means that you can't just do what everyone else does, and that is certainly quite a challenge. Someone who's been thinking about these issues even more deeply than I have is Adam Fung, who is a composer who's been involved in a number of music projects, including producing the Other Minds Festival for many years, and more recently founding and directing the Center for New Music here in San Francisco, which is actually where we record many of our podcasts, including this very one. So here to discuss new business models with myself and Dennis Yang, welcome Adam Fong. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the show. All right. Uh, So let's start with the question that everyone seems to focus on. Um, How can a musician today make money? And please tell us the answer, and uh, then we can, you know, go home. Well, you know, the, I think the the irony of it is that for the majority of musicians today, they may be able to make money in music, but probably not from their music. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with the Center for New Music, we're working with a lot of musicians who are classically trained, and most of their revenue, honestly, comes from teaching in various forms whether they're teaching at grade schools, at high schools, private lessons, or universities, or in some of the new um, for-profit academies that we're seeing uh, being put together for people to have access to music education outside of a classic school system. Uh, Most of the take-home, the reliable, the stable sources of income for musicians are coming from teaching in some form. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what I see is that a lot of creative musicians are viewing that as the better way to go rather than leaning so heavily on their own creativity for reliable personal income. Um, I think they know that it's just not the same landscape that it used to be, um, that there's not a lot of opportunities. Well, is it, um, so is, is it, how, how much of that landscape was really there before, though? I mean, is, that, is it true that that's really that different than it was in the past? Were, were there many more opportunities in the past, or is that... I think that there's a class of opportunities that's been lost. Okay. And I've been trying to float this idea by a couple of people to see how it strikes them recently. Um, and my main argument has been that we no longer have a middle class of musicians, um, which basically means that there aren't a lot of mid-level sort of record label opportunities, touring opportunities for people to earn sort of what we would consider like a a blue-collar wage, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, those opportunities, I think because they were largely sponsored by artist management companies who could run tours effectively and 
uh, record labels who would invest the money as an AR technique. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that are gone. The other opportunities, I think, are still out there. Um, but I think the, the thing that has really changed is that the sort of mid-level things that could um, be enough to live on are f much fewer and far between right now. So, I, I mean, that strikes me as really interesting because I know, you know, I've heard the, the exact opposite argument being made at times, too, which is that, you know, thanks to the Internet and the ability to do things on the Internet, that it's created a new uh, middle class of musicians because it's created a different level of things for musicians who can create, you know, and, and you know, create business models that allow them to build, you know, a, you know, a working living just by going around and doing things, you know, however it might be via various internet services rather than, you know, having to, um, you know, try and hit it big with a record label or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, but what I, what I do wonder, you know, mm -hmm. like I think we've, we've, we've been writing about kind of this middle class of musicians for a while in tech dirt now. And, you know, I think what Adam brings up is, is an interesting class of the musician that I don't think we've actually even considered, which is the performers and people yeah. that not that well, maybe, I, maybe they have their own work. Yeah. Um, but, but the, the actual performer, you know, someone whose craft is to become a really good, you know, at their instrument or essentially is that, is that a class that we haven't really ever discussed? No, I mean, I think I mean, we certainly have discussed it and, yeah. and certainly, uh, organizations like, um, uh, the Future Music Coalition, they did a big study that, that looked at a lot of those kinds of musicians in particular. Right. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting, there was the, uh, I forget the exact name, but I think it was called like the Revenue Streams Project. Right. And they sort of identified, and I don't remember the exact number, but right. it was, you know, 43 different revenue streams. And, you know, and they talked to, I, I don't also don't know the number, but, you know, a large number of musicians and basically cataloged every source of revenue that they had mm -hmm. to figure out where it was all coming from. Um, and, you know, and just cataloged all that stuff, but it was very much in that class of musicians. But it's, it is, it, it does raise a really interesting question, which is, you know, there are different kinds of musicians and right. the impact of the internet is impacting all of them in, in some very different ways. And some, it may be, creating new opportunities and certainly for some it's creating some pretty big challenges. Yeah, I think there's an important distinction there. You know, because I do a lot of work with nonprofit organizations, there's been a buzz lately about artist entrepreneurs. And I usually try to correct them and say that it's not really an artist entrepreneur that you're talking about. It's a cultural entrepreneur. And then when we think about musicians, I think really the distinguishing factor is, as Dennis is saying, there are performers who are going out and gigging, and they're making their money by gigging. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't call them entrepreneurs or business people. You know, I don't think of them as people who have business models because they're just workers for hire. You know? yeah. They don't actually accumulate assets that they can continue to draw income from. So I think you know, that entrepreneurial model might apply to a composer or to someone who's creating recordings that they own, which they can then license in various ways or distribute in various ways and draw revenue from. And that's sort of a separate conversation. But I think it is an important distinction that there are people who, you know, their trade is to make the music in real time, mm -hmm. live and in person, um, and that that is a different sort of class of earner um, and the model is very different for how to sustain sure. yourself doing that versus, right. you know, writing a song and sort of taking your chances of, of whether or not it's going to go big. Yeah, but I mean, you would think that the in the performer class that, you know, that market wouldn't be impacted by the internet quite as much because, you know, it's still, you, you don't, you know, you, you still have that need for a real live performer wherever there's a performance, Right. Possibly, this might start to depend on what city we're talking about as sure. well. And I think, you know, in, in addition to just the cost of living, I know from having gone to school, grad school at CalArts, you know, a lot of the performer friends of mine, um, yeah. they made some money playing for symphonies or playing in ensembles, but sure. most of their money was playing recording gigs, actually. And so, you know, the transformations of how music is created for the film industry and the mm -hmm. game industry also have a big impact on whether those people can make a living as playing musicians. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Though, I mean, again, I have seen. And I don't mean to sort of keep playing devil's advocate, but I, I, you know, I think <laughs> I think this is it's a really interesting discussion. You know, I have seen, and maybe it's just from I, I happen to you know luck into randomly finding these things, but I've been seeing more and more, you know, performer folks um, like setting up really interesting like YouTube channels and doing some really interesting things 
Whereas in the past, I don't think those kinds of people would have gone direct in that sort of way. You know, they did really, you know, tend to rely on studio recordings or, you know, symphony stuff or, or things like that. Um, and so I, that struck me as really interesting because they're, they're, you know, they tend to be really incredible musicians and the, the quality of the work is is amazing. And I just, you know, we'll go down these these rabbit holes of watching all these videos that they're putting together and it's it, it, for at least some of them um and obviously it's a very small percentage but it's created followings of of you know of their work where otherwise they might not have have done so so it's interesting to me to even see that for those kinds of people that you know the impact can be two ways right so they may lose out on on some recording opportunities but they're also finding new routes to um you know to to build a following and to potentially build a, a business as well I think that is probably the most inspiring. And, you know, you mentioned who can embrace the disruption. I think that is the direction that really needs to be pushed into a lot more. Um, I would agree that there are far more people who are able to get to that level of distributing their work thanks to the tools that are available now. But I also think, you know, this may be splitting hairs about where the income level is, you know. Sure. But having spoken with... Um, you know, even rock musicians who I feel like get a, a little bit better return for their energy than classical musicians. <laughs> um, you know, the people who are working so, so hard and they're pulling in like $20,000 a year. And to them, that's really making it because they're making $20,000 a year as a musician. Right. Um, yeah. And for the rest of it, it's, it's, you know, that's that's less than minimum wage. So I think um, I think there is definitely a lot of promise, like you're saying, in people setting up their own channels and direct connecting to audience. However, I think the limitation that people are coming up against right now is the ability to s properly segment their own audience. Mm. Um, you know, having a YouTube channel is great, but it treats the aficionado the exact same way as it does the person who's encountering their music for the first time. Sure. And in terms of like nonprofit development, that's one of the biggest um, pieces of wisdom that you can have as you grow a nonprofit organization is to really know who you should be cultivating and who you should be offering different products to at different huh. price levels. Um, so to me, you know, if that's going to grow out, I think the tools that are there for bands to understand, like, you know, who are the whales in their audience, who are the people who mm -hmm. have the capacity to invest in them as artists, um, that kind of knowledge is really diff difficult to parse well, right now. So, uh, you know, this goes back to the question, too, which is, I mean, how much of the focus, and, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm just asking completely <laughs> blind, but like, I mean, how much of the focus should be on, you know, on... on sort of the whales. And, and, and I kind of, you know, like, it, it seems like, to some extent, it's, it's a nonprofit point of view that, that I've been coming across like, a lot lately and talking to a variety of nonprofits where they, they get very focused on um, who's the foundation who's going to fund this, basically, or, you know, wh where, what charity is going to fund these things, whereas what's interesting to me is the ability to aggregate lots and lots of non-whales, you know, fishes, I don't know what you would call them, right? <laughs> but if you can aggregate enough of those, right. you know, you don't necessarily need the whale, and also you're not so reliant on potentially a single whale who might, you know, mm -hmm. swim off, I guess. Is well, I could see it both ways, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's inspiring to think about connecting with thousands and thousands of people as mm -hmm. a musician and as mm -hmm. an artist, and I think that's, it's a pretty high bar, and I think, unfortunately, it places a lot of premium on skills that are not germane to being a musician. Sure. Um, you know, the other thing that I think that we have to be honest about, though, is the level of investment that is that was systemic that is not systemic anymore, essentially in the creation of new work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a big part of why we founded the Center for New Music, is because there are tangible things that artists need. Specifically here in San Francisco, you know, we think a lot about space, a lot about time to connect with other musicians, and a lot about, you know, the, the room to incubate new work and to to generate innovative new ideas, whether it's materials or actual pieces or collaborations, projects, bands. Uh, you know, I feel like that is a type of activity that used to be in, um, qualified for investment from the companies who would stand to profit from their results later. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, you know, right. I think there have been a few, few hints at that, like YouTube has producers or Google is looking for ways to in-house some creative people to find a channel so that they can put some cash into that. Um, but I don't really see that happening at the scale that it needs to happen in order for the sort of creators to have enough to work with. You know, mm. there just needs to be some capital there because people have basic needs that just to do the work, not to mention live their lives. Yeah. Well, do you, I mean, do you think that that's just a gap that, 
you know, might just be a timing thing kind of as we shift from one model to another that potentially there is room for people to, to come in and, and for companies or whoever to kind of come in and, you know. Right. But that's, that seems like kind of, you know, hope that it happens and, yeah. and belief that. Well, I mean, to some extent, though, like you will often see, right? I mean, right. that that, you know, you can if there is, you know, a. a, a a market there, right. there is an opportunity to come in and, and do something interesting. I mean, that, that said, I mean, the recording industry as a whole was a really good industry to be in for a while, right? Yeah, well, like, there, I mean, so the old recording industry, I mean, I the think old the, recording there, industry. Were, there sure. were a lot of inefficiencies that certain right. people profited greatly off of. And, and, and other, through, but through and those other, inefficiencies. But, but other people yeah. also got seriously screwed, right? Sure. Um, but, I mean, you know, inefficient or not, the, the fact that they had so much cushion allowed them to make investments in certain things that maybe didn't pan out or... Yeah, but you know. again, so there are a few different things. And I think I think there are a few different issues there. And some of it is that, um, you know, some of... I, I, there was plenty of investment in sort of commercial music, right? right. So, but there was, I mean the market for for more classical musicians and stuff i think has been tough for a while since you know sort of pre internet days <laughs> um you know and and there there may be some sort of right. you know but it was but it was prof, it was profitable enough to sustain a certain level of that market and that niche right well it, it, how do you define sustain right i mean so there are plenty of musicians who would you know I don't want to say fail out of that market, but, you know, they got priced out of that market. Um, right. and, and that was true. I mean, I know of musicians who, you know, made a go at being professional classical musician right. for, for, you know, years and then, you know, gave up on it in the 80s and 90s because, you know, they couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't make a sustainable living. And that's, you know, these are people who would do things like, you know, would, be in symphonies or whatever and and even then the funding was always questionable and there are a lot of orchestras and symphonies that have been kind of scaling back or shutting down entirely right. um, because the funding for the arts for that has kind of gone out of fashion in a lot of ways and that that may just be kind of a cultural thing right right yeah i think that is a, a question of cultural relevance um, yeah. You know, for people who have not grown up with symphony orchestras in their ear or in front of their faces, there's not much justification for the scale of expense there. Right? Yeah. But I, I do think you're hitting on something that there is hope. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I, you know, when we think about the old recording industry, right, what was the real scarcity there that they were offering? To me, it's two things. It was the high quality studio equipment, which we know now is at much less of a premium, mm -hmm. and then it's a um, access to the marketing machine, you know. And they they had access to well, and, radio and, DJs and all that kind of and thing. And the distribution, I would add, for for when you had physical product, you needed that that distribution right. arm as well, right? And right, but which, you, which you don't need. That you don't need anymore. Yeah. And and then the question is the you know so the the studio equipment you don't need as fancy. Um, anymore. Right. Um, and then the marketing, like, right, so the old record label can still push some incredible marketing power, but you don't need that to the level anymore that you used to. I think that's still a great scarcity, honestly. You know, I, sure. I hinted at this before, but I yeah. think it's it's hard for people who are not who are not spending their time and their lives developing their chops as self promoters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, you know, yeah. unfortunately just from running this particular space, which works in a very small, you know, experimental music niche, um, the, the size of the crowd that shows up for a concert has nothing to do with the quality of the work. It has everything to do <laughs> right. with the quality of the well, marketing work. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So, but, but then you could argue, right. right. So traditionally though, you really needed the big, Right, you needed the concert promoters, right, to 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 do marketing, and you kind of needed to go through the the traditional record labels to to do those kinds of things. But so, is there then kind of a market for smaller scale sort of you know marketing aggregators, effectively, right? So you don't want the musician necessarily to, yeah, you know, if, if they're not good at it and if they don't want to do it. Some of them, some of them are, and that may be you know the rare case. But some musicians can do it themselves. But for those that don't, you know, you could. Right, you know, like like curation, based. Like there's, yeah. there's a been there's been kind of a clamoring for the curators now that we have access to 
you know, all of the music that is being produced today everywhere. Like now we almost are kind of have the tyranny of choice. We, we have no idea what, what to spend our time on. So like, I, I, I haven't quite seen the, the rise of curators yet. You know, I mean, it, it seems to be kind of happening here and there, but like, is there something that we can point to that's, that, that really shows that, you know, this, their new age of curators kind of is upon us or, well, I or think is that it's, not yet happening, yeah. I would say the place that I see it is in festivals. Yeah. And, you know, we yeah. wouldn't call those curators, be, but I think essentially that's yeah. what's happening. They're establishing a brand, um, you know, that has, it may have some recognizable bands, but the reason that you're shelling out a couple hundred dollars to go to these things is because, you know, that's the usual promise of a curator, that there's going to be a level of quality and that the experience will be consistent amongst itself. Right. And I think, you know, there have been other factors contributing to what's happened with, you know, tours becoming festivals, especially the cost of travel. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that's one of those areas where there's innovation happening. You know, there's a lot of innovation around what constitutes a musical experience, how special it's made by the other things that happen at that festival. And it's a space where um, the machine behind the promotion may look the same. You know, it might right. still be that same sort of traditional promoter. But the brand that they're using in front of it to attract people into it is where all the interesting stuff is happening. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So what do you think, um, you know, for the average, and, you know, I don't know if you can define average in this case, but the, the sort of musician today, if they're kind of looking at the future, what, what do you think they should be focused on? Hmm. Good question. I mean, I feel like, you know, I've done some of this work in other contexts with sort of personal and career development. Um, and I feel like the first thing that musicians really have to do is get to know themselves, which means what do I need, which is, you know, broken out in, into a couple of categories. What do I need to create new work? Mm-hmm. Um, what are my expectations on myself in terms of creating new work and what I'm going to put out there? And then for my livelihood and the kind of, um, kind of quality of life that I want, what's the, what's the level that I need there and what's the risk that I'm willing to take um, to go up or go down from that point. And I unfortunately see a lot of young people who do not know the answers to any of those questions diving into trying to be a professional musician. Are, I mean, are they um, even thinking about those questions? Or uh, You know, it's often, you know the way that people in college who are in like their <laughs> second or third year start thinking about jobs? That's kind of how it feels to me. <laughs> it's like maybe, maybe I should get an internship or maybe I should think about, you know, ways to... Yeah ways to start saving a little money. And so do you have any examples um, maybe of, of someone who is doing something right or interesting or creative that you've seen recently that might be, might be interesting? For, to... Oh, yeah, a bunch. I mean, I think the people who contend with this at um, a quicker pace tend to be the composers, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more used to working in isolation, and I think they're <laughs> a little more used to um, not being the ones who get the first paycheck, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and so what I see a, l- a lot of composers doing is, you know, piecing together an adjunct teaching gig or teaching it in an elementary school, something like that, that's sort of, it's part-time typically mm-hmm. these days, but it's very reliable and it's got big breaks built in, um, so that they can have their time to work. And then I see just a proliferation from these young people who I'm thinking of, um, tons and tons of different types of creative work from these composers. So they're creating electronic pieces that are on their own, that they distribute digitally on their own. They're doing commissions for their friends who are in string quartets or in mixed ensembles. Uh, Some of them are playing in rock bands to keep that part of things going, or they're writing interesting music for games. Um, You know, they're just piecing together tons of different opportunities on top of a part-time thing that they can rely on uh, more consistently. So, I I mean, you've mentioned, like, games a couple times, actually, and and is that, you know, has that become kind of a new area? Just, you know, uh, just thinking of kind of new markets that have opened up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think maybe it's just because we're in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there was a a big hit, a big need for composers over the last 10 years, Mm -hmm. 10 to 15 years, as games, you know, really started to um, become a huge uh, industry on its own, separate from the, you know, personal computer. Um, And there's been, you know, there's been ups and downs in that for composers and musicians as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think as things went to mobile, um, the premium started going more towards the composers and less towards the performers Hmm. uh, because people didn't really want to invest in soundstage recordings or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So really the composers gained back a little bit of power there. Um, But (laughs) it, it might, you know, kind of mirrors what's happening in commercial music too, where the producers are the ones 
whose creativity is at a premium, and the artists themselves who are making the sounds are sort of like, you know, take one out and put one back in, you'd never <laughs> notice the difference uh, kind of approach. <laughs> um, and, and then I know that, you know, especially among, um, like, rock musicians and sort of popular music, there has been sort of a renewed focus on... Um, corporate sponsorship as is, is kind of a, an opportunity area. Um, are we seeing that in you know outside of popular music too, or not as much? Um, not quite as much. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it's been a little bit difficult for classical music to um, control its brand in the new environment. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's gotten, we've gotten a little stuck. You know, I associate myself with classical music just by virtue of it not being commercial music. Right. Um, but I think we've gotten a little stuck with the image of the symphony, mm-hmm. um, with the image of the really expensive failing symphony. <laughs> um, you know, and that's not to say that there are plenty of great symphonies that are thriving, including San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that the, the corporate sponsorship has, is still based on an old value proposition, and so we have not quite discovered the new one yet. Um, but, you know, I have hope, especially for a place like Center for New Music. You know, we're right here across the street from the Spotify San Francisco office and two blocks from the Twitter office. And, you know, we rub elbows with people who uh, embrace the disruption all the time. So, <laughs> um, you know, and generally I find that those individuals, you know, whether or not the corporations have clued themselves in, the individuals who work at those places are concerned about um, the creators and the industry in general. So yeah. I do think there's... Um, there's a chance there, but I don't think uh, classical music has adapted this quickly. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me. I mean, I, I think there's this perception, um, especially outside of San Francisco, Silicon Valley, that, you know, that the the tech industry, you know, hates musicians or whatever. Um, <laughs> certainly in some circles, that, that seems to be the impression that's, that's going around. And yet, you know, whenever I talk to people in, you know, over and over again, we keep seeing different attempts to try and, you know, provide new tools and services for musicians of all different kinds. And, you know, a lot of those have failed, um, but there have been some really interesting ones. And, you know, I mean, I think YouTube has been really interesting. I mean, Twitter itself is, has become a tremendous tool for, for artists to connect and, and build relationships with fans, obviously Facebook also. And then, you know, today we're seeing things like um, crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Patreon, um, all those kinds of tools, I think, are, are really interesting. But I think, to some extent, you know, what I what I said earlier in the in the opening was this idea that, you know, I think artists sort of need to to find their own unique path, which means there isn't one, you know, specific path that is clear. That okay, if I'm going to be a musician, this is the path I take to success. Um, and part of that is, at least in my mind, is that there has to be a lot of experimentation going on in terms of, you know, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, and sort of see what catches on and be ready to to, to dump different things, but not necessarily to rely on any one thing. Well, I, th- I think one of the keys there, you know, I, I kind of go back to thinking about the folk music community, mm-hmm. and I think that's one that's been really um, insulated from all of these changes that we're talking about. And the reason is that the value of being a part of the folk music community has never really been about digital distribution or maximizing revenue. It's always been about playing live in front of people. Mm -hmm. And that was the value that was assumed by the people who listened and the people who played. And so I think there's a, there's a question, you know, part of what you're saying is to know, you know, to try a lot of different things. You also kind of have to ask yourself, what's the community that you want to be involved in as Mm -hmm. a creator? Because if we think back, you know, musical creation, that whole activity has always been a social form. Yeah, um, and the more we can sort of embrace that and accept that, I think it becomes a lot less intimidating to be a musician because you can start setting your expectations around which um, which social group it is that you want to be with. Right. Um, at least that you know, especially for people who are doing um, avant garde music, mm-hmm. that's the thing I try to talk with them the most about is to just say, you know, who do you think you can play for? Who are you willing to talk to your friends about how important this is to you? Let's start. You know, let's start there. Let's start with the people who are closest to you. And maybe that's enough for you. You know, you really have to just give that a shot. And, um, you know, like you're saying with audience, I think it's you build your community from the inside out and you just see where it takes you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we're kind of wrapping up on time, but um, I wanted to just kind of have 
what we normally do at the end is just have final thoughts in terms of, you know, what do you, what's your grand prediction, I guess? <laughs> uh, you know, where's this, where's all of this going? Where is all this going? Well, you mentioned aggregation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, that's a big um, area for growth in terms of music. And so what I see as a need that we're trying to do at the Center for New Music in my prediction, at least for the next, you know, three to five years at least, is that um, we're going to need and we will see more innovation that aggregates people and makes their work more effective in some way. Um, whether it's platforms to hear the music, platforms to connect with people, platforms to discover the cool stuff that's happening around you. I think that is really um, a big, big challenge given the landscape that we're in. And I think that's really going to be a driver for any kind of change that we see that uh, embraces what's what's happening. Cool. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. And it'll be an interesting space to watch. And uh, for everyone who's listening, um, you should uh, check out the Center for New Music. It's a very cool place. And uh, we've been very happy to be able to record here. Um, so also, I guess if you are looking to record podcasts, uh, you can come and find out about uh, recording podcasts here too, because it's a good space. It is an excellent space. Thank um, you, guys. We're uh, we're very happy to be here. So, uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you everyone for listening. And we'll be back next week. Um, um.